All right, everyone. So welcome to the Topos Colloquium. Uh, just a minute of background. So last year, Steve Audi gave a talk at the polynomial functors workshop about uh, dependent type theory. Um, and I was super excited and I realized like, oh, this, this Cartesian monad he has, what he's saying that makes it a dependent type theory is that it has a distributive law over itself. And I convinced myself this was true. And then when I was writing it up, I noticed it satisfied three, but not four of the distributive commutative squares. And I was quite chagrined. And then Brandon told me, actually, Micah and Dan Marsden have a paper about this. So I was very excited then to have Micah talking to us here. So welcome, Micah, please, when you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's always fun um, talking about this because it's something that so many people experience in their life. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy this. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my talk is called Failing at Distributive Laws because that's what um, defines my uh, PhD and um, what defines many stages in people's lives. Um, so what I want to uh, show you today is, um, well, first give a short reminder about what monads are and how you compose monads via distrib uh, laws. So what, what actually the problem is. Um, and then I want to show you uh, how I prove that some distributive laws are not possible. Um, and well, the, the fact that some are not possible is, is getting more and more uh, well known, but I really want to go into how you prove something because it's actually quite easy. And I think everyone can do this. Um, so it would be really uh, cool if, if people that now walk into uh, a problem of distributive laws not working can now prove for themselves that it's actually not possible. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to achieve with this talk, to give an insight in how, how Dan and I prove these things. Um, and then I also want to reflect a bit on, on our methods because there's, uh, I, I call this bit the crucial step. There's, there's one thing that all of our proofs have in common and um, I really want to share that with you because uh, it might give some insights in which monads compose and which do not. Um, and then I've, uh, well, I did my PhD in Oxford, but I've now moved on to Copenhagen. And I'll close with a little bit of uh, insight in what I'm doing uh, nowadays. Um, so to start, um, monads and monad compositions. Uh, monads are these really nice categorical structures that are used in functional programming and in sort of a lot of programming languages to uh, model data structures, uh, things like lists and trees, uh, and model computation effects. So those are things like exceptions, uh, reader, writer, states, all, all of that funky stuff. Um, all of these are monads. And actually a lot of more things are monads. Like once you know what a monad is, you start seeing them everywhere. Um, this is a slide that Dan used in one of his presentations where he sort of went hunting for all kind of weird things that are monads. Um, but what I really want to say with this is that whatever categorical structure you look at, um, it might be a monad. <laughs> and um, now monad compositions are useful is uh, because, well, if I have a monad that um, models a, a list, but I want a list with exceptions, and I also have a monad that does exceptions, I kind of want to combine these two to get a monad list with exceptions. Um, so really, yeah, compositional structures, there's a whole uh, community studying compositional things. It's nice when you can break down big things into smaller things. And the same with monads. Um, so before I can tell you about how to compose two monads, uh, we need to know a little bit more about what a monad is, just the definition. Uh, we don't need it for the rest of the talk. So if you're new to monads, it's, it's okay to just get the general picture and not the details. Um, but a monad is a, uh, well, people always say it's a monad in the category of endofunctors, and then that's a joke because it doesn't really tell you anything, except that it does. Um, because, um, well, it's, it's a functor, it's an endofunctor. And in my talk, we just look at the category of sets. Um, so we have a functor from set to set, and then that functor has some structure. 
And the structure it has is a monoid structure. It has a unit and a multiplication, and they satisfy the monoid uh, laws of the unit is a unit for the multiplication and the multiplication is associative. Now, to see what this means in practice, I'm gonna do the list monad, it's my, by far my favorite monad. Um, the functor takes a set to the set of all lists with elements from that original set. And then the unit, it embeds the original set in the new structure. So it, it um, takes an element from your original set X and it makes a singleton list out of it. Um, and then the multiplication is just a flattening. So if I have lists of lists, then it just concatenates all those lists into a single big list. Uh, so that is really the, the, the flavor of, of a monad. It's, um, the functor builds a structure and then you have the unit, it inserts the original set into the structure and then the multiplication is a flattening thing. Uh, and then there's a lot of more like these structure monads, like multi-set is a list, but the order doesn't matter. And power sets just sets. Uh, probability distributions also much uh, studied. They're all sort of the same flavor. And then um, on the other end, there's exception reader, writer, state. They're a bit different of flavor, but the elements are the same. And I'm focusing more on the lists and power set monads in, in this talk. Um, but okay, so a monad is a structure of three things, and then a functor, a unit, and a multiplication. So if I want to compose two of those, well, um, I can compose the functors because they're functors from set to set, so I can just compose those. And then I need to find a new unit and multiplication so that the whole thing is again a monad. And because I want it to be a composition of the two monads that I had, I kind of want to use the whole monad structure of those two components. Uh, and I can do this for the unit. I can just uh, compose the units with each other and that gives a unit of a composite monad. That's all fine. The multiplication is where the difficulty is because um, what I need is something that goes from twice the structure to once the structure. So in this case, twice, the composite structure to just once the structure. But I have the, these component multiplications. And if I just put those together, then I get something of a different type. See, it, it doesn't quite match. Here's TSTS -TS, and here's TTSS. So that, I can't use them right away. Uh, and that is where a distributive law comes in. Because you see, if I can just switch these middle S and T's here, then I have something of the right type and then I can, I can use my component multiplications. And that is a distributive law. It switches the, uh, the middle two functors, the order of the middle two functors. And then if that natural transformation that does that switching satisfies some axioms, then the resulting structure is a monad. And uh, I have the diagrams of the structure here. They're not too important for this talk, but just for people to recognize them. Um, and this, this is an old result. This is from uh, 1969 by John Beck. He figured out that if you have this uh, structure, then you get a monad, and then you can compose two monads. And well, the thing to notice is that this, this is uh, quite, quite nice, but here there's a composite of three three functor applications, that's, that's a bit who, um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you later why, why that's, uh, that's a bit scary. But in, in the end, it's just, it's just four equations that you need to check for your distributive law. And um, the reason it's called a distributive law is because the most famous example is times over plus. It's really based on this, what you learn as kids, that times distributes over plus. Um, uh, many distributive laws work in this exact same way. So here I have an example of uh, the list monad over the power set monad. So here I have a list of uh, two sets. Uh, one set has AB and the other set has C. And then I want to change that. I want to uh, change it into a set of lists. So I want to switch the order of the functors. Um, and I do that by 
well, similar to the times over plus, the, the C sort of distributes to the A and the B. So I get a list of A and C and a list of B and C. Um, this is how, uh, how a disparate law works in many cases. Um, so it also, you can do the multi-step monad over itself. It's the same times over plus idea and list over multi-set, multi-set over power set all works beautifully. So that seems quite easy. Like you just do this times over plus distributivity and that's how you compose monads. However, that's not always the case um, because sometimes that doesn't work somehow with particular monads, if you try to do this, then and you try to prove those equations that I showed quickly, they, they just don't work sometimes. And then you need to come up with something else. Um, but well, if it's not the times over plus distributivity, what, what are you going to try? Well, you have to come up with something creative to switch those two functors. And that can take a long time to find. Um, but when you find it, then you need to prove that it works. And uh, well, I just said that it was a bit tricky that there were three applications of functors in that in one of those axioms. That gets messy. If you really need to prove that if you have like lists of lists of multisets and then you need to switch things around, that's, that's difficult. So it, it takes a long time uh, to check and people do make mistakes and mistakes have ended up in the literature, uh, which is a, a bad thing. It's like, <coughs> excuse me. It, it should be a straightforward calculation, but it's, it can be really tricky and fiddly. But that's not even the worst. The worst thing is that there might not even exist distributive laws. And this is a fairly new discovery uh, Gordon Plotkin discovered this about 10 years ago, maybe 20 already, um, that the power set and the probability distribution monads, they don't distribute. And he has a really cool proof from that. Uh, but, and now in, recently it turned out that many more distributive laws don't exist. So you might spend a lot of time trying to find one when there's not even one there. And that's what I tackled in my uh, PhD thesis. Um, I've made some general theorems to prove that a lot of disparate laws don't exist, so don't bother looking for those. So hopefully that will save some time in research. And this talk is all about the method of finding those. Uh, and it's algebraic. I'm using algebra to, uh, to prove this. So very quickly, a reminder of uh, algebra. Um, algebraic theories consist of a signature uh, with operation symbols. And then together with a set of variables, they give you a set of terms by applying those operation symbols iteratively to the variables. And then if you add some equations and use equational logic, then you get equivalence classes of terms. And that is your algebraic theory. Um, so well-known theory is uh, monoids, and I'm going into the details because it will be important for the rest of this talk. So in monoids, we have a constant that takes no variables, and we have a binary that takes two variables and spits out a term. And then um, we have equations that the constant is a unit, both left and right, for the binary, and the binary is associative. I hope this is um, well known in the, in the audience. Um, and there's abelian groups where uh, we have an extra one. It's a unary symbol. And uh, well, there's still the constant is a, a unit, both left and right. And the binary is associative, but now also commutative. And there's an inverse equation here. Well, these, these are very similar to normal plus and times, so I will call them plus and times for, for this uh, presentation. And we're going to play with them a bit. Um, now, why is this important? It's, it's important because they're related to monads. Um, they actually correspond one to one to monads. So if you take the category of all the uh, models of these algebraic theories, then there is a free forgetful adjunction to the category of sets. And that adjunction gives you a monad. 
And so instead of talking about the monad, you could talk about the algebraic theory where it comes from, uh, at least for monads that correspond to algebraic theories, uh, which are the type of monads I'm considering for now. And um, those are called monads that are presentable by algebraic theories. And yeah, that's the scope of, of what I'm doing. I'm only looking at those type of monads. Um, that's cool. Uh, I can look at algebraic theories instead of the monads, but I want to know something about distributive laws. So we also need an algebraic equivalent of a distributive law before I can really do something algebraically. And that is a composite theory. And this is a notion that was defined by uh, Maciej Pierrock and Sam Staten. And they adapted it from a more general notion uh, by Eugenia Cheng. And this is really the, the core idea that I'll be using. It's quite a technical definition, but I'll first give an example of a composite theory, and then I'll give the intuition of the definition. And we'll be using it a lot in, uh, in the proof that is about to come. Um, so rings. Rings is a really familiar structure, I hope, and it's, it's the composite of abelian groups and monoids. And how is it a composite? Well, if you look at the signature for rings, then it's the signature of abelian groups and the signature of monoids just thrown together. As you have all these symbols that we saw before. And then the equations are also the equations of abelian groups and of monoids. And then with this times over plus distributivity, there it is again. <laughs> and what this does is that it really turns rings into a composite in the sense that um, if I have an equation here, here I see that there's a uh, abelian group term inside a monoid term. But um, this, this and here should really be an after because rings are a composition of abelian groups after monoids. And that means that every term can be written as a monoid term with uh, as a abelian group term with monoids inside of it. So sort of I'm first applying a monoid to some variables and then I take the resulting terms as variables for abelian groups. So that's really the composite structure there. Uh, so that brings me to the first axiom of a composite theory. It's that in a composite theory, it contains the two theories in the sense that the signature contains the two signatures of the theories and the equations of the two theories are also part of the equations of the composite theory. And terms can be separated. Uh, and separated means that you can write them in this form where one is always inside the other. Um, so here it's a B, uh, monoid terms inside abelian group terms. So there's this order of the terms. Um, but you, you need to um, be careful with that because there's a very simple theory that always allows this, which is the trivial theory where you just equal everything to, its, to everything. Uh, then I can certainly write everything in this order because everything's equal to everything. Um, but that doesn't really feel like a composition of two theories per se, because you've lost all information. And that's what this second axiom for uh, composite theories is for. It's, um, it's there to prevent a collapse of the two theories. And this one is a bit more technical, but it will be worth it to know. Um, and it's, uh, in my thesis, I call it essential uniqueness. I think Dan called this, um, coined this term. Um, as a sort of equality preservation. So here I've written a, a term in rings, uh, a times b plus c is uh, c plus a times b. That's a valid uh, equation in rings. And because these terms are both separated, so they both have the right order, they have the monoid inside the abelian group, then I can split this equality uh, into an equality of abelian groups and an equality in monoids. So what I can do is just pretend that all the monoid terms are variables. And then uh, that's what I've done here. I've uh, replaced A times B with X here. And then the resulting term should be a valid equality. The, the resulting equation should be a valid equation in abelian groups. Um, and then 
whenever I have two terms here that both get the same variable, the same x, then they should be equal in monoids. Um, so for instance, if I had replaced this a times b with an, uh, an x and this one with a y, then this wouldn't be equal in abelian groups. So I really have to replace both with an x to make this equal in abelian groups. And that means that the two occurrences of a times b need to be equal in monoids. And this uh, splitting of equality is what ensures that you really capture the essence of both component theories in this composite theory. Because if you equate too many terms here, then you can't do the splitting anymore. <coughs> and so I'll be showing you how to use this, these two axioms, how to use this composite theory uh, in a proof. But I'll first give a, a bird's eye view of um, a general no-go theorem, and then I'll go into the details. And then we'll see how, how you can use these two axioms to actually prove no-go theorems. Um, but the general, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Uh, the general steps of a no-go theorem is that we're gonna use these composite theories. So I'm gonna choose two algebraic theories that I want to compose. They should correspond to the monads that I want to compose. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yes, of course. What if there are multiple terms for the from the monoid theory? H how would you how do you extract the equations for the, the component theories from the, the expression? Uh, so what you can do is um, basically pick a variable for um, for every monoid term that you see. Um, so if, if this was um, B times A or C times D, then I would pick a different variable for that. Um, and then, well, you, it would still have to be the case that they're equal in abelian groups and in monads. And in this example, they won't be. Um, but say that this, um, this was uh, A times one here and one times A here then I would still it have would to be give- different, different variables, right? Well, I would still have to give them the same variable because otherwise the abelian group term would not be equal. Oh, I see. If there is and some assignment of variables that makes the equations equal, okay. Yeah. And then that assignment of variables dictates which monoid terms need to be equal because I'm, I'm forced by the abelian groups to have then these two equal. Um, and then if it was uh, A times one and one times A, then they would have to be equal in monoids, uh, which is the case in, in monoids. Uh, so that's sort okay. of how you get Perfect. the equalities here. Thanks. Sure. <coughs> <coughs> Um, so yeah, a no-go theorem. I've, I've chosen my two theories that I want to compose and I will, I'm gonna assume that a composite theory exists. Um, I don't know what it is, so I don't know which equations exactly it will have, but I know it has the equations of the two component theories. And I know the axioms of composite theories. So I know that terms can be separated because that was the first axiom. And I will use this uh, so I will start with a term that I know. So say that uh, S and T here both have a binary term. Then I can construct this um, binary term that is a, a, yeah, the binary of T and the binary of S uh, inside each other. But it's not separated because it's T after S. So all the T's need to be on the outside and all the S's on the inside. So this term is not separated, but by the separation axiom, I know that there is a term that is separated equal to it. I don't know what that term is, but I know there exists one because I'm assuming that there's a composite theory. And this will be my starting point. Now I'm gonna do some equational logic, uh, which we will see in the next slides, what that equational logic 
exactly will be. That depends on the theories. And eventually I want to derive a contradiction. Because if I'm able to do that, then the assumption that my composite theory exists will be false. And that's what I'm trying to prove. Okay, what's the syntax inside the T prime brackets referring to? Uh, uh, so this is a, a substitution where I have some S X will be substituted into the variable X. It's just to give a label to whichever S term will be substituted in X. But all the other ones, Y, Z, and W can be somehow. Yeah, the, so this, this is a shorthand for um, S X will be in X and S Y will be in Y. And it, it's shorthand for, for that. Got it. Um, so then if you get to derive a contradiction of this form, then you know that this particular comp uh, th these particular theories do not compose. Um, and that might be enough for you, but if you really want to go uh, to a no-go theorem, uh, then it's sort of more general, then I don't want a specific counterexample, I want a whole family of theories or monads that don't compose. Uh, so then that is where the real power of algebra comes in. Because- yeah, Sorry, a quick question. Um, yeah. Uh, why does the contradiction show that no such theory is possible? It might show it's just a trivial theory. Um, yeah, that, that is true. Um, I, I do have a, a proposition where um, if both algebraic theories, uh, T and S, uh, are non-trivial, then the composite theory will also be non-trivial. Um, that's uh, okay. something Okay, thanks. Move. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, but good point. <laughs> um, but I, I want something more general. And because I'm using algebra and equational logic, I can really see which properties I've used in the proof. Uh, we will do this in the next few slides. Uh, and that means that I can just list all of them. And, and then I know that, well, any algebraic theory satisfying those same properties will have the very same proof. Uh, so then you have a more general, uh, which I call a no-go theorem. Um, so I, I now want to show you this in, in action. And uh, I thought I'd start with something familiar and start by proving something utterly trivial, but it will be really, really useful. So I'm gonna to prove to you that in rings, which we know is a composite theory, um, x times zero is equal to zero. Um, so let's do that. And it will be really useful later on. So I start with x times zero. And when you look at it, so it's in abelian groups after monoids, but this zero is from abelian groups. And this times here is from monoids. So I have an abelian group term inside a monoid term. That's the wrong way around. So this is not separated. So I know that there is some term, and I've now just used the question mark instead of the confusing syntax. There is some separated term equal to this in rings. I just don't know what it is yet. Well, I'm gonna prove it's zero, but I don't know what it is yet. So let's start uh, reasoning. <coughs> So I'm going to uh, substitute one for X. And of course on both sides. So I, this is like a substitute one for X in this term that I don't know. And here I just plug it into X. Um, well, then I know that um, one is the unit of times. So I can simplify this to just being zero. Uh, and here I can't do anything because I don't know what this term is, but now, this zero is now a separated term. It no longer has um, monoid terms on the outside. It's just an abelian group term that's separated. So now I have an equality between two separated terms. Because this question mark originally was set separated and this one that I substitute in is a monoid term. So that keeps it separated. So then I can use the uh, second axiom of uh, composite theories and that's that I know that the equality holds, that I can split this equality. 
So if I just take the abelian group part of question mark, then I know that that abelian group part is equal to zero. Um, and then it doesn't matter which monoid terms are substituted into that abelian group part of question mark because zero doesn't have any variables. So it will still be zero. So question mark is equal to zero. That's what we've proven using composite theories now. And now we're gonna do the analysis. So what, what have I used? Well, I use that uh, one is a unit for times. That's basically all I've used. Um, but zero is a unit for plus. So I can just switch this around. And now I have the exact same proof, but now in uh, what I call gnirs, it's uh, rings, but the other way around. So instead of abelian groups after monoids, I can look at monoids after abelian groups, um, where I now want all the monoid terms on the outside and the abelian group terms on the inside. And you see it's the exact same proof, just plus switch for times and uh, zero for one, just all of them switched. And then we can prove that x plus one is equal to one in GNIRS, if that was a composite theory. Um, I mean, I can quickly go, it's, it's the exact same. So I start with this non-separated term, um, which is equal to some separated term. Uh, I substitute zero now, and zero is a unit. And then I have two separated terms. And well, then the monoid part of question mark has to be equal to one because of this splitting equalities. And then I know that the entire question mark is one because it doesn't have any variables. So it's just the exact same as we've just done, just slightly more confusing because now it's, I mean, we're used to the equation x times zero is zero, but we're not used to x plus one is one. Um, and this now will be the key to proving that uh, Gnirs doesn't exist. So let's derive uh, the contradiction and prove that there's no composite theory of monoids after abelian groups. Uh, so, well, we just shown that x plus one is equal to one in, in Gnirs. Uh, and from that, I can show that x is equal to zero. And that will give the contradiction because, well, if x is equal to zero, I can just substitute uh, y for x, which is also equal to zero then, and then x and y are equal for any two variables. So we're in the trivial theory. And uh, that's a contradiction because if it was a composite theory, then it wouldn't be trivial. Um, I can show you the, the reasoning, how we get there. So it's basically um, you add minus one to both sides and then reason it's what children can do, but I'm gonna write it out completely because I wanna know which axioms I use. <coughs> So here's the x plus one uh, side of it, and then I add minus one to it. And then reasoning back, I use associativity, and then an inverse equation, and then a unit to get to x. Going the other way, because I know x plus one is equal to one, I have uh, one plus minus one, and with the inverse equation, I get zero. So following this whole train proves that x is equal to zero. Um, and yeah, that, that finishes the proof. This is a proof that monoids after abelian groups is not a composite theory. Um, and this is a result that has been open for 50 years because in the original paper of John Beck, um, he says that having a distributive law of the monoid monad um, composed with the abelian group monad the wrong way um, will break, will most likely break some mathematics. And then that suggests that it has little chance of being a triple. But he doesn't prove it. He just has this intuition that it will break things. Um, and now we've proven it in, in two slides, um, which is really cool 50 years later. And it was really this idea of a composite theory that, that made it possible. 
And that's what I've been doing in my thesis. I've, um, I've done this uh, with many examples uh, over and over. Um, some fit on a slide like this one. Uh, some use the exact same method, but then you just need to try some more substitutions, uh, try again, and five pages later, finally, you get something. Um, so these are examples of, um, of combinations that fall out. I mean, there's a power set over itself, which was proven by uh, Barta Klin and Julian Salamanca. Um, the distribution monad over itself, which was my very first failed distributive law. I thought I had one, turns out doesn't exist. Um, also combinations of uh, power set and distribution. There's of course the original example of uh, Plotkin, which was amazing. And um, Dan has translated that proof into this algebraic method. And that uh, showed that any combination of power set with itself or distribution with itself and any combination of power set and distribution, it all doesn't work, it's all by the same proof. It's really cool. Um, and then a completely different proof is, well, same method, just a bit more pages, is the list monad. That's my second failure. I thought I had a distributive law of the list monad, but no, nope, not possible. Um, a surprising one is uh, multiset, because it's known to distribute over itself. But um, multiset to the power of three or higher, multiset to the power of n, uh, doesn't work. And it's because of a really cute uh, theorem that I call too many constants theorem. It's basically when, uh, when you have an algebraic theory that has two or more constants, which are too many, and the other algebraic theory satisfies some properties, then they don't form a composite theory. Uh, that also proves that a combination of exception and list doesn't work. Um, the exception monad is known to combine with any other monad, but in the other order. So it would be list after exception is perfectly fine, but exception after list breaks because, well, when exception has more than one exception. If it has one, it's okay, but if it has two or more, then it has too many and it doesn't work. And yeah, there's, there's various other examples. Um, um, well, I hope after uh, this talk, you might be able to find your own. Just play with your own monads and <laughs> see if you can make a proof like this. Um, but there's one thing that I wanna share with you that I've learned by doing all these examples and generalizing them. There's, there's one step that keeps coming back. So I wanna focus on that a bit. Um, so uh, just a reminder of what we did so I can explain the step is I, I started with a non-separated term. So I had this, this X here that was not separated and I knew it was because of separation that it's equal to something separated. Uh, but then the second axiom of composite theories needs an equality between two separated terms. So somehow I need to get from an equation between a non-separated and a separated term to an equation between two separated terms. And that's where the manipulation equational logic comes in. But how do you do that? Well, in our example, we, um, we started with x times zero, and then I substituted one into it to then get zero. Uh, and I used this unity equation, this, this unit equation, that one times x is equal to x. And that is a step that comes back in every single one of my proofs. Um, and it's what I call reducing a term to a variable. So there's, there's like a more complicated term here and here is just a variable. And it, it works because if you, uh, now I'm having S's and T's again. So if I have this non-separated term where I want the S to be inside the T, um, then if I can, if, if T has a unit, and I um, plot the unit into y, then it just reduces to x, and then I'm left with just this, this s term, and that's separated. And similarly, if, uh, if s has a unit, and I uh, put that unit into z, then this reduces to just t, and that is separated. Um, or if I can somehow 
make this reduced to a constant where the constant is of either theory, like the x times zero is zero equation. That is also separated, just the constant is separated. And this term, th this strategy comes back in every single one of my proofs because there's many different equations that do this. So I've seen, we've used units in, in this uh, talk, but there's also idempotence, which is important in the uh, power set proof. Um, absorption, which you see in, in logic type uh, proofs, there's this absorption equation. It does the same. It's like it has a bigger equation here, and then it's just a variable on one side. And the inverse. Inverse was also a vital step in the proof that I just showed you. Um, so all of these equations, they're really vital. And what I'm hoping is, uh, I have this as a conjecture, is that this is um, necessary. Um, yeah, I always get confused between necessary and sufficient, but yeah, necessary for, for a distributive law to fail, that you have an equation of this type, that you have something reduces to a variable. Um, and this is how I formulated it in my thesis. It's, um, that was written over a year ago, and I didn't realize that you could also reduce things to a constant. But here I uh, say that if you're somehow via a substitution can reduce a term to a variable, that, that will be necessary. And to this date, I don't know of any failing distributive law that doesn't have this. So any theory that doesn't have units or idempotence or all of that is fine. So there's um, non-empty lists. They, that is list without the unit equation, basically. It works. There is a distributive law of non-empty list over itself. And as far as I know, this is the case for every single monad. It works as long as it doesn't have such an equation in it. Um, I don't have a proof of this. This is just a, uh, a feeling, a conjecture. Um, I would love to be proven wrong because that means there's something interesting going on. I would, of course, also love to be proven right. Um, but yeah, it's not a sufficient condition because the multiset distributes over itself even when it has a unit. So it's not a guarantee that it will break, but it's, it's a likeliness. Um, so yeah, go out there and see if your monad has this property. And if it doesn't, then hopefully you're safe. <laughs> but uh, that is the message. Um, and then finally, I want to uh, quickly say what I'm, uh, what I'm doing nowadays. It's still monads. It's uh, just a little bit different. I'm uh, working on the delay monad. Uh, this is not one of those algebraic monads. Oh. But um, I'm, I'm now in Copenhagen with uh, Rasmus Mölberg, and he works on uh, guarded recursion. And this is in type theory. And it's a way of introducing recursion to type theory that doesn't break the uh, Curry-Howard correspondence. So you can actually have uh, proof assistants like Agda and Koch still work with recursion. Uh, you just need to do this safe guarded recursion. And it has a monad, because of course it does. Um, and it's, it's modeling computation steps. So what, what I've written here is that, um, well, the, the monad's doing this. Um, it takes a set type, a type uh, X, and then either you have an, I just think of sets of as types as sets. I know it's wrong, but that's just how I think about them. Um, so either, either you have something of type X right now, uh, or this, this triangle means later, or you might need to wait a computation step and you might get one later. How much later? At least one step. Because after one step, you're back in this monad, which means either you have it right now, or you might need to wait a bit for later. Um, and that is sort of the recursion, but with a time step every, between every recursive step. Uh, and now this monad, uh, we want to combine it with the power set, list, multiset, all these nice algebraic monads. And uh, before I joined the group, um, Rasmus and uh, Andrea, they tried to combine it with power sets. Um, 
with a distributive law. Um, but that proved a bit difficult because um, the time steps, they don't really play nice with the idempotence. Um, because idempotence, sort of, if you have something that takes three time steps to compute, but if you want to keep idempotence, then that suddenly becomes six time steps because you have twice the elements. And it's, it doesn't really interact nicely with that. Um, and we don't know if it's the idempotence per se that is the problem or just the whole monad structure. I'm currently looking at that. But if you try to make a distributive law, then either the number of time steps doesn't add up or the idempotence fails in the case of power set. Uh, but I've proven a distributive law for a list and one for a multiset uh, with the delay monad. So it's the delay monad uh, goes on the outside. So it's list delay to delay list. Uh, and I know these work because I've done them in Agda. <laughs> I am very confident that these are okay. Um, and the next steps will be that I want to um, do the reader and state monads and eventually derive a general theory of which monads do combine with the delay monad and which do not. Uh, that's the, the goal. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, what is, two questions actually, uh, in general for, when you define a, a, a monad by a, an equation like that, you would read it as like a fun, the, the, the functor expression, uh, the polynomial functor expression, right? But there is an, an L on the other side. So I don't know what that means. How would you define it? And is that triangle um, some categorical object, a functor or yeah, it's, something um, there are underlying theory? Uh, it's something in the... Um... In the type theory, um, it's called a later modality. Um, and it's it's something that is added on the, the type theory as an external thing. Um, but I am still learning the finer finer details of, uh, of all of this. You could say it's a patch to the compiler. You yeah. You couldn't implement it in okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's implemented in cubicle acta at the, at the moment. So it's guarded cubicle acta. Um, did you have a second question? Is your yeah, yeah, to... about the, the <laughs> how, how would you, how is, can you tell us how it, how that monad is defined because that, that couldn't be a definition. I mean, um, there's a, an L on the right hand side. Uh, Since so it's, it's officially defined via a fixed point, I think. Um, but it's um, you you have a um, a now function that sort of does the part where you have it right now. And then there's a, a step function that does a, well, first a step and then you're back into a, a monad. So actually it's, I think in Agda, I kind of write it like this, but oh, I must okay. say you that can, I'm- You can do recursion inside of the, oh, recursion in the future. So yeah, yeah, re it's recursion in the future. Right okay, I see. That's it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still quite new to this. So I'm, I'm not good at explaining it yet. <laughs> Yeah, can I ask a follow-up? Hey, can't we just use ordinary mathematics and drop the triangle? And it's just the algebraic theory with a single delay operator, unary delay operator, and no axioms. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think In that's that how I think about it. That's, yes, that's how I want to think about it too. Uh, so, um, so then can you just use algebraic distributive laws and forget about categorical ones? just have the delay operator distribute over the non-determinism in the obvious algebraic way. Um, yeah, so you kind of want to get all the, the steps out, uh, but the non, that it doesn't, uh, one of the multiplication axioms fails. It doesn't, the, the number of steps doesn't add up. No, no, I mean, forget about categorical yeah. distributive laws and just write the delay of A or B is equal to delay of A or delay of B. And then you'll get a monad. Maybe it's the wrong one. I don't mm. know. But you'll get you'll get yeah, something. Yeah, uh, you can do the free combination. So yeah, not a distributive law, but uh, the free combination of both. That that works. 
I don't know if no, that not, is what you what you mean. No, it's no, it's not. I mean, you take the two yeah. theories together and add the equation. Mm -hmm. If if the unary thing is called delta or something, then it's delta of a or b equals delta of a or delta of b. So to get um, in the future, in the future, if I'm going to get mm -hmm. a choice, that's a choice between futures. I mean, maybe that's the wrong way to think. Yeah, I think thing uh, you could write. I think we want it the other way around. So if if you have uh, the future of a or the future of B, I want to make a future of A or B. That that's the way around the. That's the same thing. It's equality. Yeah, but um, I think then you can derive an inconsistency where, with the idempotence, you're kind of. It then I think you can derive an inconsistency in that theory then. Ah, okay. Uh, because well, since the the categorical one, the multiplication law fails, then it has to correspond to the algebraic one also failing in, in some way. No, no, nothing's going to fail. It's just, it's just a algebraic theory. I mean, you, you're not going to get oh, stripped yeah, of but it, it's But who cares? As long as you get an algebraic theory, it does yeah, the job. Yeah, okay, you, you might. Um, I, I don't know about that. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's something I always yeah. wondered. I mean, you can perfectly well combine algebraic theories. There's no yeah. religious, there's yeah. no religious reason to insist on categorical distributive laws. No, okay, that, anyway. that is true. Uh, that's yeah. very true. So yeah, if you just combine it, then yeah, I think you might even if you get that algebraic theory. So either it's it's going to be inconsistent in some way, or you get the free combination of the algebraic theories. But I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that is the way I eventually want to learn how to look at it. Just let go of the whole distributive law and only look at the theories. And then it doesn't need to be a composite theory. It just, as long as you get a nice algebraic theory, then it's okay. And then derive what that corresponds to functorially. Um, but I'm, I'm not there yet, but that, that is one of the things I want to look at. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm very trained in, uh, in looking at just distributive loss. <laughs> it's hard to let go. Um, but yeah, that, that is the, uh, the end of my talk. So um, yeah, what I've shown you is that uh, not all monads compose via distributive law. I mean, this was known, but it's very good to iterate. <laughs> and it's really more monads than than you might think that don't compose. And um, I have used algebra to uh, prove these things um, and not to prove only counterexamples, but even go like no-go theorems by listing all of the steps, all of the properties that I use. You can sort of make a more general statement than just a, a counterexample. And the most important property is this uh, reducing a variable to a term that is important in every single one of my proofs. And I'm really hoping that that is the only thing that can fail these things. Um, and then I just had a summary of, yeah, what I'm doing now that I just told you. Um, but yeah, that's the end of my talk. Great, thank you, Micah. Okay, we have some time for questions. Um, some have already been asked during the talk. Um, but if anyone wants to raise their hand or it's like Brandon is first. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this talk. This is really cool stuff. Um, what I'm wondering, well, maybe I'll put it this way. I, I might hypothetically have an agenda of what is finding out what kinds of these no-go theorems, uh, sorry, my audio was great. Um, I might have an agenda of finding out what kinds of these no-go theorems you can show for monads like the free category monad on graphs, where mm. your category is no longer sets, but diagrams of some sort like graphs. Uh, do you know like what kind of, do you think these similar results might apply in a setting like that? 
Uh, yes, they, they might. Um, I haven't been able to prove anything yet, but um, an, an easy thing you might do is use a forgetful functor. Uh, so go from uh, graphs or categories, uh, use the forgetful functor to set. Um, and then if your monads on graphs or categories um, would compose, then their forgetful cousins in sets should compose too. And if you know that they don't compose in set, then they're not going to compose upwards. Um, but for, for other things, you would need to have um, a notion of composite theory that takes all of this extra structure into account. And I haven't been able to look into that yet, but um, that would be really exciting to know. Yeah, thank you. Looks like um, Juan is next. Hi, so uh, thanks for the talk. I mean. It's amazing, it's elegant and, and seems very simple, but there's so much complexity to be explored. But uh, to add more complexity to the subject, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask what, there's a, one of the conditions imposed on, on composite theories is that it is not trivial, uh, but it's actually more than that, right? It's that it is, uh, not any more trivial than it needs to be. It respects yeah. only the qualities that come from the base series. Now, I'm wondering if there is um, gradations of uh, subcomposite theories that would uh, allow for more um, for more uh, equalities. And what would the structure of that be? I, I don't expect Ooh. that you have thought about it, but I, I mean, it seems no, like I a haven't, but, good um... idea. That, that makes me think of uh, weak distributive laws, actually, because there's, I've, I've only looked at, is it a distributive law or not? But um, I have people as uh, Daniela Petrizan and, and others, um, I think Valeria as well, actually. Uh, they've looked at um, dropping axioms from the distributive law on the category side. Um, I don't know what that corresponds to algebraically, but it might be like a weaker version of composite theory. So maybe it's exactly what you were hinting at. Um, yeah, that'd be cool to find out. That's nice. I have an, also another question that might might sound, uh, it might be an intentional uh, confrontation. <laughs> um, what do you think about monad transformation uh, tra uh, transformers, which are used in Agda and, and Mm. strongly typed functional languages. I mean, it, it seems to solve the problem of uh, non-distributive monads. I, I must say I'm, I'm not an expert uh, on, on how this works. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can uh, give a very intelligent answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm only okay. just yeah, learning thanks. Haskell and, and Agda. But uh, if you want to know, it's instead of defining the monad as a simply a functor, it takes as an argument another monad and constructs a new mm. monad with the added effect. Uh, I never mm. really looked into it, what would be the relation between those monad transformers and, and uh, the categorical interpretation of those, if it would be a, a higher a monad monad or something like that, I don't know. Okay, it looks like Valeria is next. Oh, what, what a lovely talk, Mike. Very great, very, wonder, very nice indeed. I, I wanted to go back to Tim's original question on the chat. I don't know if you've seen it. We, no, he I'm sorry. to know about the, um, the, uh, the algebraic presentable monads because, mm. um, you know, I kind of, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about are the monads like kind of um, continuation co-monads and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and and you know, it, it's just the it's. I, I'd like to know if you thought anything about where is the borderline between the algebraic things and the things that are not algebraic. So a bit along the lines of what um, Juan was just talking about. And, and kind of, if I may, one more kind of along these lines is, is, you know, kind of if 
other uh, weakenings of the notions would be to go to something like um, Mousev, Mousev uh, operations, right? Because, you know, instead of having your uh, strict things like this, this thing is equal to just a variable or a constant, mm -hmm. you can have, um, I mean, it, it, I was reminded of the Mousev operations because of your uh, not, to, not more than two uh, mm. example. So I, I think, you know, maybe the category theorists, the old category theorists have a few more tricks up their sleeves for you. You know, you, you, you could have a look there. And then my last thing was about rewriting because, you know, the beauty of this stuff is that you can do rewriting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you could. And um, yeah. I, I wondered, you know, kind of being, I mean, Copenhagen, I mean, I can, Amsterdam would be better for that, but you know, there's all, all those guys doing, doing kind of like Hans Zantema and stuff like that, doing termination of rewriting and stuff like that. So maybe you can get your composite theories um, defined in terms of rewriting and, and with. I think actually, um, so the, this composite theory is a, a small part of. Um, Pierre Oxen Staten's paper, and I think the paper is actually more about rewriting than it is about composite theories. It just turned out that this tiny piece of their paper was super useful for me. Oh, how lovely. I mean, I, I had no idea, sorry. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. When you actually say things that actually make sense, right? So, thanks. But yeah, I always end up using tiny pieces of papers and I'm forgetting what the rest of the paper was actually used for. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to move it along a little bit. So we have one last question um, before we stop the live stream. Maybe a quick one if possible. Gordon? Uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, so at the beginning, as you said, if you take two monads, you get a unit, but perhaps not a distributive law. Uh, do you know any examples in which, okay, you don't have a distributive law, but ST is still a monad with a hope for unit? Um, yes, actually, uh, the list monad. <laughs> uh, uh. Uh, Bartek Klin has an example where um, he was able to put a monad structure on the double list monad. Um, and I think that even uses the composite unit. It just doesn't have the, the multiplication because that goes wrong. But um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the monad structure was exactly, but um, okay. he figured out a monad structure on the double list monad. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And thanks for the talk too. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, let's just thank Micah again. And we'll stop the live stream. And then if anyone, if Micah, if you have more,